Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Ben Howe, and uh, I hope that un unlike me, you guys weren't watching Monday Night Football last night. Uh, I was, and I was amazed at how many commercials were about um, logistics and shipping and the supply chain and just how much um, that seems to be what our world is about right now. Um, Blaine, I wanted to talk to you uh, to, to start out because uh, Beta is a, is a different kind of company. It's, um, it's, it makes uh, battery-powered airplanes, uh, which there's a lot of talk about these days, but they're, they're different from other companies. Um, and they're made in, in, in Vermont. Um, there's a lot to differentiate it. Uh, and I was curious if you could talk a little bit about um, how, you, you know, when you started working there, what, what, when did you know that Beta was going to be different from other companies and have this potential to change uh, the, the, supply, the supply chain? It, uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. You're right. We are a, a bit of a different company. I think, you know, uh, we've been called a bunch of hooligans up in Vermont, right? We uh, approach things a little differently. Um, and, you know, what, what we focus on is how can we have the biggest impact as soon as we can on a future of sustainable aviation? And for us, you know, most of our uh, compatriots in this space that are building electric airplanes are focused on urban air mobility in the air taxi market, kind of saving uh, people time on their commutes. And while I think there's massive value in that over time, there's a real need now for new forms of air mobility and logistics and supply chain, whether that be uh, in e-commerce or in rural health access or in an organ distribution, whatever it may be. So we're addressing the cargo market first because that's where we think we can have the largest impact. We're also not looking at this as um, just an urban air mobility problem. We're looking at this as reconnecting communities uh, through regional air mobility and, and putting in charging infrastructure in small town USA uh, as well as at, at large cities <clears throat> to unlock economic potential and, and provide access and, and uh, equity in these areas. Um, it, the, the moment that I kind of realized that Beta had a chance to be different and and, and, and potentially you know, change the future of, of aviation was I showed up and the hangar was, it was, you've been to the hangar, it's nice now. When I showed up, it, it, it wasn't, it was, probably should have been bulldozed. Um, uh, but there was, a, there was an aircraft sitting in it and it was called AVA and it was our first prototype. And as we had a contract to build it and there was eight people in the company at the time. And over the course of 10 months, we built and flew the, at the time, the largest manned electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft in the world. Um, and we looked at it and said, yeah, that's not gonna close commercially. It's, it's not gonna certify. It's gonna be too hard to maintain. It's just not gonna work. So we threw it out. Uh, and, and what I realized, and then we started over and built an entirely new design. We learned a lot. We learned a lot what not to do. We learned a lot of good things to take forward. But we have this philosophy that paper projects never fail, right? You get caught in this loop of indecision. And so we, we have this philosophy of, of build it, fly it, break it, and fly it again. Uh, and build it again. And, and, you know, we took the aircraft out to Bentonville, Arkansas and back and it's part of that philosophy. But I think it's that willingness to get in and do the pragmatic work uh, to build things and, and, and rapid innovation cycles that, al that, that allow us to achieve our missions faster. Ron, you're, you're an old hand at, at, at uh, what's kind of, for the rest of us, is something new. Uh, Automation warehouses. You've been doing this uh, since since 2008. Uh, are you seeing uh, innovation right now that 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 uh, matches what you what you what's, what you saw at the beginning when you got into this industry, or has um, or or I guess what what I'm what I'm, I'm curious to know is is. Is, 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 uh, are you seeing similar adoption rates among smaller companies, and, and how far do we have to go? Yeah, good question. So originally, pre-COVID, uh, just about everything was based on return on investment. So if you didn't come in to the sea level and have a good presentation on the fact that this was going to pay back in 18 months, 24 months max, uh, there wasn't much appetite for moving forward. COVID changed that. So it really shined a spotlight on the fact that we just can't continue to throw people at a problem, right? It's throwing them at peak, throwing them at other issues. And we need to be able to automate a lot of the things that humans don't like to do. And that's what I always challenge my engineers, anybody that I'm advising. You know, we can do 
automating the easy stuff is easy. Right? And automating the hard stuff, meaning the stuff that people don't want to do, the things that cause back and neck injuries, the things that uh, prevent people that are in their, in their 50s and 60s from having a job doing that type of stuff because it's too physical. Um, trying to change that. So what ended up happening with COVID is you now see a business continuity aspect where people are more focused on business continuity. How do I keep the lights on? How do I keep this place running, right? So when COVID hit, not only was it right after peak, right? It was February time frame, right? And they had just pulled back on all those seasonal workers. And then you had a lot of your own workers that were saying, hey, I'm high risk, I can't come in. So at that point, a lot of CEOs are looking at this strategically saying, I'm losing market share, right? Even Amazon had to pull back on two day delivery, right? And so people are saying, hey, I, I need something in two days. Maybe I'm going on a flight or maybe I'm doing something else, right? I need my headset, right? I can't get it here, I'm gonna go there. So a lot of people are looking at it from a business continuity lens, which has now increased the appetite again, and it is allowing a lot more innovation, even deeper into other companies. So I tend to bifurcate into three different buckets, the industry. So you've got the big players, Amazon, Walmart, which I've been fortunate enough to work at both. And they've got the deep pockets. They can afford to invest and do some really cool stuff. And then you've got some of the middle market players that are trying to get into e-commerce because they realize the way to compete is they have to have omni-channel, right? They have to be there. Um, but they don't have the engineering teams in that depth. So they're looking to integrators. And those integrators are just starting to step up their games a little bit in the innovation. And you know, before it was just, I'll buy the pieces and glue them together. Now you're starting to see a little bit more innovation in that space. And then the third bucket is the digitally native folks, the guys that started up as a, a marketplace, right? And by force, brute force, right? Just they were manually picking, realized, okay, my walk distances are getting too long, my variable costs are increasing. I need to automate. And they're typically looking at lighter automation, right angle transfers just to get things in and out of the building, some ways to receive faster, then some you know, person to goods technology, some AMRs, things like that. But you're starting to see that adoption rate pick up. Can I interrupt you, AMRs? Yes. Sorry, thank you for doing that. Yes, autonomous mobile robots, okay. right? So the, the little ones that tend to run out to a shelf You'll have a human that would be dedicated to a couple aisles of the building rather than running throughout the entire building, maybe walking 30 miles in their day. They're now in a certain zone. The robot will drive out to where the pick needs to be made and then get the person's attention to say, make the pick. Once the pick's made, the person interfaces with the robot and says, okay, done. And now it may drive six inches to the next pick or it may go completely into somebody else's zone. On the subject of robots, um, I, I had uh, robotic surgery recently um, uh, for a hernia, and my, my doctor said, you're lucky, and I was like, well, trying to imagine why I'd be lucky to have a robot <laughs> do surgery on me, but uh, she said, no, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's actually safer, uh, but this was a first for me. Um, Sam, this is, this is um, you know, surgery, I'm sorry, safety is really your area with, with robots. Can you talk a little bit about how, how Fort, your company, is making uh, robots safer. Sure, sure. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, and to your point about robotic surgery, I was I was reading TechCrunch last week and saw a robotic dental um, solution getting uh, venture capital. And uh, thinking about doing a robotic root canal honestly sounds a lot better to me than getting a regular root canal. But for it's a communications platform for smart machines. Uh, we handle functional safety and cybersecurity uh, across all verticals where you are seeing automation um, come to bear. And really, the subject of this panel is, is fulfillment. And often, we, we think in fulfillment about AMRs. And, and the public thinks about uh, automation with regard to self-driving cars. And it's kind of like what is right in front of us ends up being the thing that we're talking and thinking about the most. But the fact is, the the forces that are enabling this change in society have been working for a long time. I mean, in the last 50 years, we've seen productivity growth in this country that's been way slower than the 100 years before that. Um, 
there are still four million injuries in the American workplace every single year. Four million medically consulted injuries. This is completely crazy to, to people that, that work in, in smart machines. Um, and, uh, and the labor shortages. I'm sorry, my mic fell off. Um, the labor shortages, we talk a lot about those um, post-COVID, but the labor shortages, I'm sure if you're a, a warehousing logistics practitioner here, you were having labor shortages before COVID too. Um, so all of those together meant that we had a, an environment ripe for automation and fulfillment is only one piece of it. It stretches from the, the, the raw materials, the mine and the farm, they're becoming automated. The manufacturing facility, the processing facility, they're being automated. Obviously, fulfillment in warehousing and distribution, last mile delivery, the home is being automated. Uh, waste recovery or, or waste collection and recycling and landfills are being automated. So you have, for any product, the end-to-end -end, um, you know, symphony orchestra of processes is, is being uh, developed into uh, an automated workflow. And then the, the, the building of those facilities and the transportation in between those facilities. So very soon we're going to be in this world where machines are working hand in hand with human. And I'm, I'm getting back to safety, I promise. Um, so if you imagine the, the world where all these machines in every slice of society are working hand in hand in humans, really you can't have the machines hurting humans, right? And then a secondary piece of that is they're all connected to the internet. So you can't then have them hacked or, or uh, compromised by a bad actor, whoever that bad actor may be. And then that lead to a safety issue. So Ford is, it really exists to, to um, invent the future in those two regards, safety and security, so that we can achieve the, you know. Well, Ron, I've, I've heard you say that sa safety is really the, it's, it's, it's the hard problem. Uh, it's it, you, when you're trying to figure out how to, how to get logistics right, that's, that's where the, the real engineering and, uh, and creative genius lies. Can you, can you Tell us a little bit more about what you meant by that. Sure. So when you're trying to solve these complex problems that today, you know, humans are very intuitive. So things like robotic each picking, trying to pick these individual items out of a batch tote and recognize what it's picking. Those are very hard problems to solve. And if you want to move as fast as a human, right, in doing that, um, obviously I don't want to put robotics in that are slow or, you know, can't keep up with what we were doing today. So I'm trying to keep that same pace. So now when you start thinking about, now I gotta move this robot at a pretty decent pace, right? I've gotta make decisions on the fly, right? I've gotta do these things. You gotta make sure that you're doing them safely, right? Because there can be humans in that environment. So in you know real estate, they always say location, location, location. When I'm talking about safety around robotics, it's environment, environment, environment. Right, I can have a shuttle fully autonomous going 30 miles an hour if it's inside a structure that no humans can get into. And if you look at automotive, where I started my career, the fencing started getting bigger and thicker and you know, it got to the point that it was more to keep the robots like from getting out. It seemed like they were gonna escape than trying to keep people you know, safe. So it was getting a little crazy. But now we have cobots. Right? We have things that you can collaborate with. They, they'll notice that, hey, somebody, I just bumped something, right? Whereas that didn't happen before, right? I, in automotive, I've seen robots like go horribly wrong, right? If you program something like spraying black wax on a car and you say it's a sedan, that it happens not to be a sedan, you'll make it a sedan. You'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll cave out the whole back end of it and blow the windows out because the robot's just gonna do what it was told to do. Mm -hmm. But now there's safety features in these robots and we're building them in to be more situationally aware of what is happening around them. And so whether it's camera mesh technologies, meaning having multiple cameras observing the area, um, even if you look at Amazon Robotics now, the people can wear vests and walk into the field with the bots walking around and it detects and knows they're there, right? So it's, it's about, <coughs> excuse me, it's about connecting the human element and making sure that the solution that you're doing, yes, is fast, it's gonna get the job done, it's gonna be efficient, but it also is extremely safe. And you also have the point that you were bringing up about I can't have people hacking into it, 
right? I can't have the robot going rogue, picking the toad up and throwing it or whatever. Right? They, they, they've got to be able to be safe, even from somebody hacking in. So we, we've got about five minutes left. And, and Blaine, one thing I wanted to talk to you about is um, shift a little bit from, from automation to e efficiencies. Uh, one, one way that, that, that beta seems to have the potential to, to have a big impact on logistics is by opening up uh, new, new economic spaces. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah, it, um, we see automation clearly as, as, the, as a future opportunity, and, but we think the technology exists now to create efficiencies in throughput and build capacity into the network. And the way that we think about that is if you look at um, the, and this was, came to us from UPS, uh, who's a customer and a partner of ours, said, look, their network through Louisville was built to put a thousand shirts on a pallet to Macy's. And now they're being asked to put those same thousand shirts in a thousand boxes to a thousand homes dispersed around the country, right? You guys know this problem well, much better than I do. But by creating environmentally sustainable, cost-effective mobility solutions, uh, whether they be on the ground or, or in the air, um, you can now unlock it, uh, that network and create a, what we call a continuous flow mesh network. And so what that practically means is up in Burlington, Vermont, where, where I live and where our company's based, um, we're considered rural, um, and, and so when Amazon went to the three-day shipping or four-day shipping on Prime, we were more like four or five days, and we haven't kind of come back to that two-day, um, whereas, you know, your same day here in New York. And so how do you provide the same level of service? How do you open up those opportunities? Because we now perform commerce by car uh, in Vermont. Well, y y you, you find innovative ways to skip the hub, and for, or, you, or you bring low-cost mobility solutions like our aircraft to deliver point-to-point uh, networks. And what that does, it has these non-obvious uh, uh, kind of side effects. And, and you know, if, if all of a sudden UPS can not have to get a, a package on an aircraft to go to Manchester, New Hampshire, to Louisville, back up to Syracuse to go, and they can go direct from Burlington to Syracuse, you've now opened up two hours on either end of that network. And so what that means is a craftsperson or, or a, a, a local business in Vermont now can get their package to UPS by 7 o'clock instead of by 3 o'clock or by 5 o'clock, right? So you now allow them to compete on a, on a similar scale as everybody else in an urban environment. And, you, and so it opens up these kind of non-obvious economic benefits, but then you transform that same model to um, rural health access, right? And we're working with Health and Human Services on a program in rural Mississippi right now um, where if you live in rural Mississippi or really rural anywhere, super rural anywhere in the U.S., you don't have the same access to, uh, to health care that everyone has, right? The, the, the anti-venom drugs, the high-value drugs are sitting in a univers university health center in an urban environment, and they're either flown out to the patient or the patient's flown in on helicopter. And if you can start to provide services at low cost, uh, environmentally sustainable ways, um, by getting access to these folks and keeping their families at home instead of bringing their families in to, to be with them when they're being cared for in a, in a hospital, you change the economic landscape in those super rural areas just through changing a little a quarter turn adjustment on how healthcare is provided using these new forms of mobility. And so w we see um, the electrification of aviation not just as a way to save an hour a day, but really to reconnect these communities and open up economic and, uh, access and, and health equity and social equity uh, to people that just haven't had access before. All right, we've got just a little bit of time left. I'm going to ask all three of you just to, to say a little bit about what trends in, in fulfillment you think right now are, are, are the most exciting. Um, and maybe you can also throw in one that you think um, is just noise. Do you want to start? So, I mean, I often call them robot colored glasses because when I look at the whole world, I see this robots working hand in hand with people. Um, so I think what inspires me and our company is that automated society that we're, that we're moving toward. Um, I think what is noise is uh, the effect on the workforce. I think it's a really hopeful thing for humans between the, the existing uh, subpar situa situation with safety um, and the productivity gains that we can have with automation. I think the workforce picture will be much better in an automated society. Um, and, uh, and um, yeah. yeah. I would build on that and say that it's around the safety of the individual and making sustainable jobs. So as I mentioned before, you know, uh, running around and slugging 40-pound bags of dog food is not fun, 
right? And you don't see a lot of elderly people doing that, right? So making those jobs such that the robots are doing it, I can upskill the labor force then to maintain and fix the robot. They can basically sit there and read a book, right? And then respond when the robot needs help. And then what's interesting is now you start getting into human in the loop technologies. So that means I don't even need a human present. The human could be sitting here and resetting uh, a robot that had a problem in Dallas and then re do one in the Bay Area and then turn around and do one in New York and literally 30 seconds apart. Um, but all robotic systems, all the auto autonomous systems tend to fail the same way. They just stop in a safe environment and wait and hover for a human intervention. That human intervention can come with a person standing right there or remotely. So I think as we start doing more and more of that and people are less afraid of robots taking their jobs and embrace the fact that it's helping me do my job, it's upscaling and upskilling my job. So I can actually afford to pay that person more because they're now a technician taking care of multiple robots. They're much more productive because there's so many things that are happening rather than one person packing a box, for instance. Yeah, that briefly, those are phenomenal uh, answers, by the way. Um, you know, what, what I think is the most encouraging trend for, for us, and we're a mission-based company uh, focused on the future of sustainable aviation, and is that sustainability is not a term used for greenwashing anymore. It, it's real. Uh, people are moving towards it because of the real economic benefits that come from it. Uh, the reliability benefits that come of it. So we're seeing this shift from this is a nice novelty that I'll pay a, a green premium for to there's actual real technology at play that can solve these really hard challenges of autonomy and robotics and, and, and reliable fulfillment in a, an environmentally sustainable way. And then that's just the innovation happening there is just remarkable. I'm guessing we have some uh, questions for a pretty stimulating conversation. We do, great stuff. Uh, we have more questions than we have time for, so I picked my two favorites. When will we see drones delivering packages here in New York? Uh, that's a great question. So our aircraft is uh, probably not gonna drop something off at your apartment. It's a 50-foot wingspan, think, <laughs> think flying UPS cargo truck, right? Not, uh, not drone. Uh, I think there's incredible uh, momentum happening now in the, in the drone delivery space. There's a lot of beyond visual line of flight uh, site flights uh, happening. Uh, New York State just actually opened up a corridor in upstate to, to do testing there. I think from a middle mile perspective, we'll be delivering packages in a fully sustainable uh, uh, way uh, in 2025. And so this is not something that's out 20 years. Um, we're flying them now. It's, uh, we're working in partnership with the FAA, but we'll be, you're, you, you'll soon have a choice to have your packages delivered in a, uh, from, from start to finish fully sustainably. But you know, it's not just the uh, aerial drone, it's a combination of autonomous delivery sure. vans with humanoids that are, humanoid robots that are taking the package from the delivery van and then large autonomous robots that go on the street and then small autonomous robots that go on the sidewalk and then several different form factors of aerial right. drones, and then they all kind of get shooken together, and then the, the format that shakes out is kind of unique to each individual situation. That's so right. It's not all about the drone. I gotta, I gotta put a plug in for the ground robots. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. Okay, so last question. What technology do you wish you had that does not currently exist? You want to go for it? Or uh, to sensors that recognize people at a SIL-3 safety level. Yeah. That, that's Not just objects, but people. That's a good one. Um, I think from a fulfillment standpoint, there's still that middle mile, last mile, too much lugging and slugging of cases. And those cases can be up to 50-pound parcels. So I see a lot of automation inside the four walls of a building. When it comes to loading and unloading dead stack trailers, meaning that cases are on the floor, literally wall to wall to the ceiling to the tailgate, um, I think there's opportunities there. Um, we've been doing that for many, many years. So if you look at all the automation that we put into it, and then we have two humans in a trailer for 45 minutes, just so they can close the door and it drives three miles down the road to a UPS or FedEx or US Postal Service, and they undo it the exact same way we just loaded it. So I think there's plenty of opportunities to get the human touches, the back injuries, the neck injuries, 
the strains, sprains, everything else out of that sector. But you have stretch from Boston Dynamics. I always have to plug Fort customers. <laughs> yes, yes. And so I've had fortunate pleasure of working with some of those folks and designing some of those solutions. So that's why I picked that one. I, <laughs> I, I like that space. I think there's plenty of opportunity. Uh, yeah, for us, it's pretty simple. And I think for anyone trying to electrify uh, fleet vehicles, it's battery energy density. We talked about you're, you're trying to help a friend electrify a food truck. <laughs> Uh, is more complicated than it actually sounds on its face. But it, um, battery energy density is just at the point where it's you can make a commercially viable cargo aircraft, and there's incredible uh, innovation happening in that space. But uh, if I had a magic wish, wish list, it would be uh, energy density that's about 10x where we are today. <laughs> uh, but yeah. it, it, it'll happen. You know, by, by, you know, by the end of the decade, we'll be at a place where, where you're in pretty good shape. Well, great. You had the last word, Blaine. Thank you so Perfect. very much. Thank you. Yeah.